Hi everybody, uh, today's guest is an old friend, a hell of a comedian. He's kind of like a machine of comedy, I would say. It's just in him. I give you my friend, Jimmy Carr. Here he comes, here he comes, there he is, look at this. Um, oh. What do you think? You're not wearing a tie, I can only assume there's been some sort of mix up. Um, I've gone for Bruce Springsteen relaxing at home. Did you ever see the Bruce Springsteen, or I presume, of course, you've heard it, the, um, the, the sort of in the biography when he talks about what he wears. Yes. And he said, I wear my father's work clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So provocative, and it kind of makes so much sense. All right, there you go. Now I've got just you. That's nice. Okay. So most of these interviews, in fact, all of them are friends of mine. And I say, do you remember when we met? Now, with you... I don't right. remember the specific. You think we're friends, yeah? <laughs> All right. Listen, let's agree to disagree and move on. Uh, when did we first meet? I remember sort of, sort of circling each other, like knowing about you. And I remember I probably annually retentive was the first time we sort of worked together and properly spent a bit of time together. But we knew each other before then. But I, I think th probably through David Williams. Oh, yeah. I hadn't made that connection. But I remember you being on the circuit and... I remember playing at Ha Bloody Ha in the late 90s in Chiswick. And do you remember we ended up on the stage together? Yeah, I, and you did this thing which I, you know, quite made it because a lot of people talk a very strong game about improv. A lot of people go, well, I'm going to go, I'm just going to wing it up there. And then you see them three nights in a row doing exactly the same routine. You go, well, I mean, you're, you're sort of sort of winging it, but I mean, <laughs> it's basically a show of ad fibs. <laughs> is, you know, my yeah. term for the, yeah, yeah, it's an ad lib that I do every night in yeah. the same place. Yeah. So I remember that show clearly because I was doing like the middle 20 and you were going on after. You genuinely had nothing going on. So you were like nervous before and I was going, why are you nervous? And then it transpired you had nothing going on stage. Yeah. Nothing yeah. at all. And you were just hoping something would come and you knew who the comedy character was and it was it was the you were one step removed from you yeah but it was close enough to you that you yeah. could kind of yeah. you just knew every point of view that's right so i was doing keith barrett and i would go on stage with with literally nothing i wouldn't do that now i'd have something but i remember then we ended up weren't we trading bits with each other i remember and i remember coming off thinking oh that was really good wow wow i don't know if people really know you for your for your stand-up because it's no. it, like you've done so little you've, mm. you've got so very many children to be at home for so <laughs> that thing of like you've not been on the road doing stuff and like and, and some of the acting things like you know the, the Gavin and Stacey thing is almost like becomes bigger than I must pick you up on the, the the comment about my not having done that many shows I mean I compared to what what are you drinking I'd say that's a green juice and then I'm taking like uh vitamins Wow. Even even as we speak, you are thinking health. You're thinking, I want to be ready when this pandemic has passed. I want to be oh, straight out. Back out there, yeah. I mean, OK, so you've done a lot of shows. So how many shows would you do in a typical year? I know what you're saying. I've not done anywhere near the shows you've done. But you yeah. started by saying people don't know about your stand-up. And, and it's true, and it, it sort of irks me a bit because, you know, I, I've done a few tours with, with plenty of shows but nothing like your amount. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about your work ethic, and I want to talk about life on the road for you. Yeah, I like, I must say, I really like that thing of being a sort of, um, no matter what size venue you're playing, we're all sort of doing the same thing. Yes, yes. I, I suppose the cliche, the rock and roll cliche is that it's all about that hour or two hours you spend on stage. Mm. And I, I sort of don't buy into that. I like the whole thing. The whole thing is the job. Going and getting the train or driving and getting there and the quality of your day and then getting a nice meal. And the whole thing is, it's very pleasurable. Like if you like your own company, it's great. Yeah, but you're very disciplined. That's the impression I get of you. Look, I'm in the right stream for me. I've gone a river and it's flowing. I'm not swimming against the tide. So I'm in an industry where no one works that hard. <laughs> yes, yes, right? and yes. People talk a good game and then they sort of don't do stuff. Well, I mean, he's not a he's not an out and out comedian, is he? Our friend David Williams, but he has a phenomenal work ethic. Yeah, I mean, the kids' books. It's yeah, it's amazing because it's it's I'm writing a book in lockdown and it's so much work mm. and it's a different kind of work. I don't know whether that's kind of you know you sort of pay me a compliment saying you work you know you've got a great work ethic. Yeah, and I kind of shoo it away because I suppose whatever your work ethic is you value the other work ethic higher in the same way that you will sometimes 
look at someone else's talent and go, well, wouldn't it be great to have that? How did Marion and Jeff come about? Because that was the first time I was aware of you. Yeah. And I remember kind of seeing that and just thinking, because they were sort of perfect vignettes. That, that was from a need that I don't have now. That and Human Remains came from a desire to make my mark. Uh, because I, because the world was passing me by, you know, I had time and. But did you did you write it or did it? Because it, it feels like a, a Mike Lee in his funnier moments, like something that was a bit Alan Bennett, mm. but it felt very improv. It it was pretty scripted with, with Hugo Blick, who 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 directed it and and produced it. He and I wrote it together. The same with Human Remains. There's sort of collaborations as well. That's the interesting thing about. I think leaning into your what you're best at, where you've been most successful, but in terms of what you feel is the best work you've done, and it's been your collaborations. You as yes. a collaborator. Yeah, that's true. I remember James Corden going for lunch with James. He'd got the new script of Gavin and Stacey finished, and he was so excited about, and he sort of pitched me what you were saying about meeting people at the service station, <laughs> and then he was like, he was like, yeah, but when he does it, it's going to be also the trip, the idea that you get together with. Yeah. With Steve, and somehow you bring out, I think, sort of the best in him. Well, I always think I'm more of a carer than a collaborator with Steve. That's my humorous line for it anyway. Uh, no, we do, because we're interesting, he, he and I. We sort of, we're like a Venn diagram. Where we overlap, very similar. Where we don't, we're not. Yeah, it's, it's really, it really feels like you're sort of eavesdropping on a friendship. Yeah. Which is well, a lovely kind of thing about, like, what you're going to uh, television or film for. So talking about your, your work ethic... And the, the number of shows I just see, and I'm like, my God, where is he now? And sometimes yeah. two shows a night. Two shows a night is a, is a, is a joy. It's so fun to do. Um, the, I suppose it's that thing where the worst year, worst year, best year, depends how you look at it, was 2018. I did, I think, 40 countries. Uh, and that was, that was very, that really took its toll, actually. It was kind of, it was physically a lot tougher than I thought it would, because it's only really getting to airports and getting in the back of carts. It's not, and then being on stage. It's nothing cardiovascular. It's not like doing an Ironman thing, but I think it was something like 160 flights, and I was pretty broken by the end of it. The show itself, I remember talking to you once, and you saying to me, and let's check I'm remembering this properly, that you come off the stage after a show in no different state than when you went on the show. In terms of... You, you've not been jumping off the monitors doing guitar solos and going, ah, good night, Wembley, and off you come and you're, you're exhausted. No, although I've, I've chatted to a couple of people. I chatted to my, my physio about it, and he was saying, oh, it's actually quite a lot of, it, you're standing kind of stock still, pretty much, or you're standing there for sort of two hours maybe on stage. If I do two shows in a night, if I do four hours on stage, I really notice it in my, uh, yeah. I kind of notice it uh, in, my, in my hips. Like, yeah. I'm like, oh, God, a bit sore the next day, just from sort of standing there. I'm finding that as I get older, I used to hear people saying, oh, it must be exhausting on stage. Because I, I move around a bit, and as you said, I, I, I make some stuff up within it. There's usually a musical element now, da-da-da-da-da, I'm up and down. So there's a physicality to it. But I'm finding now, I'm 55, that, yeah, a show does take it out of you. And, and the mental side of it, you are, you're pretty bloody focused. I suppose that thing of, like, going... You know, what's the difference between a funny guy in life and being funny professionally <laughs> is being able to sort of turn it on and go, right, I'm on a panel show. I will deliver now for the next three hours. Yeah, and, and also then, doing it no matter what's going on in your life. That's the time when comedy pays out. I always think it's a, it's a very sad thing. If there's a thousand people in a theatre, I always try and think about the people that really need it. Yeah. Like, if there's a thousand people there, most of them, I'd say at least 950, are doing great. They've bought tickets to a comedy show because they think you're funny anyway. So there's a high before the high, and then they come to the show with the intention of laughing, you're preaching to the choir. But then I always think there's, there's a bunch of people there, 5%, 10%, whatever it is, that are having a bad day. Yeah, yeah. That, that have lost someone in the last sort of six weeks or something, that, yeah. that have, that, you know, especially you know, when we go back out post-pandemic, that have had a really grisly time and kind of need this. Mm. And actually in my life, the times when humor has really had a benefit have been the very rough times. Yeah. When, yeah. Like, you know, remember when my when my mother died going back on stage and it was a it was a 20 minutes, a 20 minutes kind of respite from grief. Yeah. Because you were on stage and you were too your conscious mind was too busy. Yeah. With being on stage, the kind of uh, the adrenaline of it, you were too busy doing that. To, and then you come off and kind of flomp afterwards. But it was a really nice thing to have a bit of a break. Do you sense when you look at an audience 
that the vast majority, hey, come to see Jimmy, fantastic. This is my experience. But you've got a, there's going to be a percentage that are there either because someone at work couldn't go, so do you want to have the ticket instead? Or it's the partner of the fan who's yeah. come along. And oh, no, a third of my income is from people that don't like me. <laughs> oh, no, 100%. I remember that sometimes you've got to be careful because sometimes on stage, I'll be, I look around at people. I always like the house lights up a little bit. I like to be able to see people's faces. I like to be able to, I mean, some people don't like that at all. They want pitch mm. black. I like to be able to see people's faces, see if they're laughing, see what works. Sort of, it's better for your timing, I think, mm. the visual thing of hearing mm. with your, like, what's going on. And you always identify a couple of people that are very stony faced. Uh, in Montreal, doing my first hour in Montreal, I remember it was like me and Zach Galifianakis had the same room. We were both doing hours sort of back to back. And I did an hour, and there was about maybe 200 people in, not a huge room. There's a guy in the front row, just stony faced, looking at me. Just give me the stink eye all the way through. And the show went great. And then afterwards, I was like, this guy really bothered me. And afterwards, I was walking out, and he was in the lobby. And I thought, oh, this guy's going to be offended by something or whatever. Great. I'd love to have a word with this guy. And he comes up to me and he goes, uh, he goes, I, I, I born, I born Italy. I from, I live, grow, grow up in Basel. English, my fourth language. I really have to concentrate, but you're the best. I love you the most. Wow. And it was like, oh, I was all, I was all keyed up for the guy to go. Yeah. Ah, so, 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 which means that, you know, we can get it wrong. You are brilliant at comebacks to heckles. I'm guessing that after a while, the heckles are, you've heard them all, basically. The idea that when you're in a room, let's say there's a thousand people come and see you at a theatre in Inverness, they all share your sense of humour. Yeah. There's an incredible kind of, and yeah. you kind of go, it's such a waste that they don't get to say anything. <laughs> you, you know that there are great stories out there. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, you know, the audience members might not be able to carry a show, but there's great little stories. There's great vignettes. There's great little things. And, and sometimes you'll get a damn witty heckle. You know, I mean, I've had that. I've had somewhere where I've just applauded and I've said that might be the funniest thing you hear all evening. You know, there are there are funny yeah. people out there, but thank Brilliant. God most kind of, of them. Empowering them to join you is yeah. lovely. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I see you dying on stage happily. When, when you're older, I don't mean your gags aren't working. I mean, I mean, I think you will, you will be doing it and doing it and doing it. I'm sort of viewing the corona crisis as half time for life. <laughs> That's great. I'm about the right age that I'm cutting up the oranges and, and I'm looking around <laughs> and going, right, great. Are we? How are we playing this so far? Do we like our strategy? Do we like who we are as a team? Yeah. Do, you know, it's that kind of moment where we're in the locker room kind of pacing around going, is this what we wanted? And my conclusion, I mean, impossibly smugly, is, yeah, I, I think I'm in the right job for me. I really like touring. I really like being a comic. Yeah. And you know, what else would you rather be doing? Well, you are younger than me. So if we follow this analogy through, am I now stood in a circle on the pitch about to enjoy extra time? Well, I, I don't know. I think you could you could wish for this is half time for life, isn't it? What are you, 55? 55. Yeah, I think by the time we hit 100, it won't be such an unusual thing. Oh, that's a lovely thought, isn't it? The thought that you well, have. Well, medical, medical science is just, it seems to be pushing that boundary all the time. So it feels like Corona has also been sort of, um, it's been like retirement camp. We all got a year to go, what's it like when you're retired? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. You would never retire, though, would you? I mean, I will never retire. I'll do fewer shows, but I'll never retire. I think I may be retired. <laughs> well, it's that lovely line, isn't it? The, uh, you know, the joke that ends my career, I've already told it. It's on YouTube somewhere waiting. Yeah. It's like a landmine, that yeah. joke. Yeah. We don't know which one it is. We can't take it down because we don't know. I imagine that what I will do is I will keep going and I, at some point the venues will get smaller. But I don't mind that because my outgoings will be smaller. And, and also perhaps the time of the performance, not long before he died, about a year before he died, Roger Moore was touring Britain doing an evening with but not always an evening with. I, I was driving around on one of my tours and I saw a sign advertising an afternoon with Sir Roger Moore. And that was so wow. appealing. 
I mean, it's interesting that you're moving into music at this, I would say, uh, 11th hour um, of your career. No, but there's something about you that's very um, old school showbiz, like even the, the people that you adore. <laughs> like when you talk about Ronnie Corbett, I know you do the impression, but you also adored the man. His last tour was with full orchestra, oh, uh, you know, an yeah. evening with. Yeah. Yeah, did the stories and the things, but yeah. twenty minutes and then the band would play, and it was it was a proper like like a Vegas night out. Yeah, I feel that's the aspiration for you. Yeah, well, I wanted to I wanted to do stuff with music. I I've been kind of shy of it, I suppose, for fear of 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 ridicule and that thing of the bloke off the telly now is singing. But I got over that and I I started this tour and and I loved it and that's what I'll I'll resume with. I'm very into my music. I really like listening to music, and it, whenever we've sort of spoken about it, it's like you've got these key acts in your life that you go, right, he really means something to me, mm. and you're all in on that person. You're just an absolute expert. Like, your observation on Rod Stewart, I find very entertaining. That every And I'd never noticed that, and I've listened to a lot of Small Faces and a lot of Rod Stewart over the years. I'd never noticed the little tick that you, like, the Rod Stewart tell. Yeah. If you're playing cards with Rod Stewart, he will always... On many of his songs, he'll go, yeah. yeah. For no reason. Nothing to do with the rest of the song. It's just a thing he'll, he'll have. And if, once, you, once you know it, you'll hear it in so many songs. So there'll be a, the, the, like an instrumental break or something. You go, yeah. <laughs> Is he just thinking of what a, what a blessed career he's had? Yeah, I reckon he. I reckon he the probably. The I sold in the seventies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the women I've been married to. Yeah. Some of the ones I wasn't married to. Yeah. Now, while we're on music, I don't know if you've told this story publicly, but you told it to me. Uh, Bruce Springsteen is one of the great loves of my life, and you. I mean, had an experience. I mean, well, I was doing a gig in. This was in New York about maybe two years ago. And it was the uh, it was stand up for heroes. So it was it was a gig where not only did you do the gig to benefit the charity that helps ex servicemen, but there's quite a lot of ex servicemen that come. Some of them have been very seriously injured, and it's a really lovely charity. And the, the it's, it's always run the same way. It's at Madison Square Gardens. Uh, Bruce Springsteen headlines, and there's five comics on. And little old Jim, I was in town, and they said, "Well, why don't you go up and do ten minutes?" I said, "My pleasure." So we're playing Madison Square Gardens, which is quite trippy anyway. I mean, it's quite fun because you're, you're in this incredible room, right? We're in a smaller room downstairs. So it's like a four and a half thousand, five thousand seater. We get there early, you know, with the suit bag and the thing. And the guy on the door, Mr. Kyle, you know, they've got the pictures up so they recognize you. So go upstairs, walk straight into the green room. As I'm, as I'm walking in there, facing the wall in double denim, looking at something on the wall, it's the boss. And... I'd just done Desert Island Discs like two weeks before. Anyway, so I see the button, and I went, oh, I listened to your Desert Island Discs, I thought it was great. I like the way you picked this, and I read the biography, and the bit where you talk about your father's clothes and the fact that you wore the same clothes that he went to work in when you go to work. And anyway, I'm kind of chatting away to, I mean, it's Bruce Springsteen, and I'm on scent. I'm like 20 minutes just chatting to the guy. And, oh, right. and as I'm chatting away, I kind of look over his shoulder, and I see on the open door, it says Bruce Springsteen. And in an instant, my stomach goes, oh. I realise, and then I ask anyway, even though I know the answer, I go, is this, is this the green room or your dressing room? And he goes, it's my dressing room. And I went, oh. I'd like, I've opened a drink. I mean, I mean. <laughs> well, I'm you took, you took oh, his stuff and you started having his stuff. Yes, I've, had, I've, I've got like a... I've got like a fizzy water and, a, and I'm eating carrots. Oh, boy. Like, give a fuck about this. Like, of <laughs> in, I've just walked in a stranger. I've thrown my bags in the corner. I've thrown my bags down on the chair. I'm just chatting away to this guy. He's got no choice in it at all. I mean, his life has been on the road. This is his home, ostensibly, I've wandered into. I went, I should probably go. And he went, yeah. <laughs> For the rest of the day, the nice thing was my dressing room was sort of next door and we get myself kind of a bit, a little bit humiliated, but like, nah, it's fun. Um, and then for the rest of the day, because I was there at like five o'clock and he was doing his sound check. So I went down to watch him sound check, which was magnificent with his wife who has this 
voice of an angel. I mean, just cuts through you. Yeah. And so all the time, I was kind of wandering past his dressing room a lot. So he's like strumming away. And I was just sort of nodding my head in and going, practice makes perfect. Okay. <laughs> and then he, I, was, I said, what songs are you doing? And he, sort of, he said, I'm, I'm, I, he said, I'm going to do four songs. And I said, you're going to do your own or covers? <laughs> and he said, I'm going to do my own stuff. And I went, it's just, and he laughed. I mean, he was like, you know, but, and incredibly, for, for a, I mean, obviously he maybe appreciated I was doing the gig or whatever, but what a gent. And could have been a dick about it, would have been well within his rights. I didn't. I forgot from when you told me before that you were tucking into the dips and the tricks. I thought it was the green room. It looked like a green room. Oh, that's incredible. That's incredible. Well, listen, thank you for, for, for doing this. It's the middle of the afternoon now, viewer, and having spoken to Jimmy, I will now go down, perhaps have a drink, and I'm going to watch a football match on the television. I'm not a big football fan, but it's Spurs against Chelsea. And since I watched that Spurs documentary... I'm in love with Jose Mourinho and Gareth Bale, who's Welsh, who I know a little bit. It's Spurs versus who? Chelsea. Is one of them playing over Zoom? How's it going to work? No, no, they, they play... I think they now have a small audience. They don't call it an audience. A small crowd, don't they? Oh, no, I've, I've done that. I, went, I once went to see Chelsea Arsenal, but I went with um, uh, uh, Dasha Abramovich uh, and, <laughs> right. and a friend. Yes. And, I mean, I would say... I'm not a huge football fan, but the standard of sushi is unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. So we're there at the football football um, the the game, and uh, and I, I really properly did that thing of going. Um, what are we doing in the interval? Yes. Yeah. And my, yeah. my mate just went. It's half time. Yeah. Yeah. But just disappointed, not angry, just disappointed. But I'm I'm in theatre. I love that. I love the fact whether you like it or not. I'm kind of I'm I'm a show person. I'm from show folk, so I will say interval rehearsal rather than training. I've said that before. Um, it, it, audience rather than crowd, because that's my world. Yeah, I kind of, I like that. I kind of feel like you're leaning into that more. I'm really, I don't know. I'm really looking forward to seeing it anyway. But the, the idea of you doing a show, it, like it's got the, it's got the, um, the, the, the backbone of music in it. The band is so good. They're much better than you'd expect, you know, because you don't, they don't need to be that good. You could just, but these guys are so good and you can just see the audience going, wow. Are you, are you, um, how many in the band? What, what is it? I, I think there's it. eight. Eight? Yeah. <laughs> Have you got brass? <laughs> yeah, I've got trumpet. I've got Seb Philpot on trumpet, who in, just by total coincidence played on my only number one single, Islands in the Stream. And I've got Giacomo Smith on clarinet. Who had exactly an hour for the mention of it in the sweet <laughs> state. Ah, OK. Because it gets mentioned every week. It was, I think, I think 61 minutes on my clock this week. So, um, you, Rob you... Brighton, everyone, had a number one. That is such an extraordinary thing when you kind of, when you look back at your career, like the high points, the, oh. I mean, for me, I mean, maybe Human Remains is like, it's, it's early and tough to beat, but Marin and Jeff was magnificent. And then the tours, which are kind of ephemeral because they slightly disappear after yeah. they're done, but yeah. great to do. Yeah. And then you look at the, the Gavin and Stacey stuff, which is so beloved. Now, I watched it all again recently. God, it stands up, doesn't it? The writing is so... Uh, that's exactly what Claire and I say. If, it, if it's on and we come across it, we watched the, the first one of series two when they come back from the um, a honeymoon and they're all in the pub, uh, in the restaurant. And I think I turned to her and I said, this is good. It's just so well written, so well cast. It was such an edgy BBC. I remember knowing James when he was sort of writing it. And the pitch was, he said, uh, oh yeah, one family's called the Wests and the other one's called the Shipmans. Yeah. I'm not sure if we'll get away with it. Yeah. It was like, yeah. oh yeah, maybe this will become incredibly beloved and we won't mention that again. <laughs> right, on that note, I'm, I'm going to go and watch football now because that's the sort of man I am. Thanks for doing okay, this. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. I'll be uh, I'll be in the front row for the tour. Thanks so much. Uh, bye bye. Tour.